Hallelujah. God is an awesome God. In your Bibles, the book of Isaiah the prophet, chapter 19, verses 18 to 20. Isaiah chapter 19, verses 18 to 20. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of the Hebrews of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One of them will be called the City of Destruction. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a memorial stone to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors. And he, the Lord God Almighty, will send them a savior, a great defender, and he will rescue them. Please be seated. Welcome to Global Evangelistic Center here in Kissimmee, Florida. Uh, we are reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 19, 18 to 20 was what I just read. The Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, which is based in Egypt, Northeast Africa, and the Middle East, with the largest Christian presence in the Middle East of about 18 to 22 million members worldwide with about 12 million of those members in Egypt impacting also Libya, Sudan, South Sudan and the Middle East. The Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria powerfully relates to this scripture. And as we have been in a series that has stemmed from the prophetic revelation of Yeshua regarding the kingdom suffering violence, which is a very relevant prophecy for our present church age and a powerful charge for us to be proactive intercessors by first educating ourselves over what is really going on in both the natural world and in the kingdom of God because prophecy is being fulfilled right now for the end times and the soon return of Christ to bring that seventh and final end time dispensation. And there is a great end time revival with the birth pains for it now being prophetically perceived in our present day. And the, the mighty hand of God is moving and, and shifting. And, and if, we are, if we are to perceive what he is really doing in our time, then we, 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 we will have to understand the necessity for us to be plugged into the Middle East because both the promises made by the Lord God Almighty to Jacob, Israel, and to Ishmael, a key progenitor of the Arabic people and the Islamic faith, both the promises made to Israel and to Ishmael will be relevant in these end times. Amen? The Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria is a powerful symbol of prophetic revelation even just by its title, Coptic, which basically means Egyptian, but its, its root linguistically is from it being an Afro-Asiac language of ancient Egypt, but, but, but now really only serves as the liturgical language of the Coptic Church. And Alexandria, Egypt's 
second largest city and, and one of the Middle East's most uh, major economic centers. Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great and became an important center of the Hellenistic civilization and worldwide influence as we have just recently celebrated Hanukkah. We have understood that the influence of Alexander's early conquest were still in place 100 years after his death unto Antiochus IV, the Hellenistic Greek king who rose to power uh, in the region that we are discussing. And, and, and history shows us that the brutality of his oppression of the Hebrew people led to him placing a Hellenistic priest in the temple and massacring Jews and prohibiting the practice of the Jewish religion and desecrating the temple by requiring the sacrifice of pigs on the altar. And in a nutshell, how Hanukkah commemorates the rededication of the Holy Temple, the second temple, in Jerusalem at the time by a group of Jewish rebel warriors called the Maccabees. But, but now the, the, the salient point <laughs> of great significance here being that at the end of the age, the violence that the kingdom will suffer will see a revival in the kingdom of light and in the kingdom of darkness. And Hellenism, which is the cultic side at age-old spirituality of Greece, and the fascinating spirit of Alexander the Great laid the firm foundation for the abomination of the temple. But saints of God, unless we fully understand what all that spirit entails and how it has affected us even until this present day, then we will not be able to stand up to intercede for the holy temple in Jerusalem. God is calling for watchmen on the wall. We will not be able to stand up to intercede for the holy temple in Jerusalem or even against us personally because we are the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So our spiritual temples must be set ablaze by his presence. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a memorial stone to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors and he will send them a savior, a great defender and he will rescue them. Sister Ormi, get ready to read for me Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. 700 years after the prophet Isaiah's time, that which was prophesied by Isaiah marked the season of its fulfillment with an impact for all the Abrahamic descendants of faith. He will send them a savior, a great defender, and he, the Lord God Almighty, will rescue them. Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 15. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Amen. Now when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. 
for Herod intends to search for the child in order to, to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Hosea. Hmm. Out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt hmm. I called my son. Now the Coptic church of Alexandria was established by the apostle Mark. And uh, historical records show us that Christ would have had to have been a child of, of just a few years old when he left Egypt because Christ was born in the 35th year of Herod the Great's reign and Herod died in the 37th year of reign. So, 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 so this particular trip would not have been the one to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea that Matthew speaks about. Hosea 11 and 1. When Israel was a child, a young nation, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Hosea 11 verses 1 to 3. Get ready to read that for me, Brother Tess. Hosea chapter 11 verses 1 to 3. We also know from Hosea's prophecy that this is a prophecy of dual significance because contextually it is also a reference and it is a warning to the Hebrew people who would have uh, intimately related to the compassionate care of Abba, <laughs> Abba Father, in the wilderness as they escaped uh, their plight of bondage and, and servitude in Egypt, a, a loving and compassionate heavenly Father that demonstrates his miraculous power uh, as his miraculous power is a manifestation of his love. Hosea chapter 11 verses 1 to 3. When Israel was a child, hmm. a young nation, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Hmm. The more they, the prophets called them to repentance and obedience, the more they went away from him. They kept sacrificing to the ba Baals hmm. and burning incense to the carved images. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk taking them in my arms, nurturing the young nation, but they did not know that I healed them. My God. And sometimes uh, we, we sing the song when we're going through rough times, if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Tell me where would I be? Where would I be? Sometimes you don't even know when you're going through trials and when you're going through tribulation and when you're going through challenges. It's the Lord, God Almighty, that's carrying you. You don't know how you made it to your next step. You don't know how you made it to your next meal. You don't know how God supernaturally opened the windows of heaven. The only calm and assurance that we have is God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time, he is good. RJ, get ready to, to read for me 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior, a great defender, and he will rescue them. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Get ready for me, Brother RJ. Now, even though Isaiah is not mentioned by name in the Quran or the Hadith, he is well respected by their scholars as a true Hebrew prophet. And as such, 
then Isaiah is not speaking of his own opinion or, or from a socio-political motivation. He is speaking as an oracle of a true and living God whose word can never fail. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, mm. whereunto you, you do well that ye take heed as unto the light. Shinth in a dark place hmm. until day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of mm. the scripture is any private inter inter interpretation. Hmm. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Men moved by the Holy Spirit of God spoke what thus saith the Lord, not motivated by political ambition, not motivated by fleecing sheep, not motivated by anything other than the unction of the Ruach HaKodesh. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The apostle Mark was the founder of the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, which was one of the most important seats of ecclesiastical power in the early days of the church. And even as the trip of baby Jesus, Joseph, his adopted father, and Mary, his biological mother, take on a new significance to the, the Coptic Christians as, as they relate to how they sought refuge in, in, in Egypt from, from, from Herod's uh, persecution. They too, the Coptic Christians, they are brothers and sisters. They too can relate to being persecuted in a more powerful way in our present time as, as Christians are facing violent persecution by Islamic jihadists and terrorists that long to destroy the foundations of our faith and the truth of the gospel that contradicts their political ideologies that masquerade under religion. This ain't about religion. This is about politics. Even as the trip of the baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary take on a new significance to the Coptic Christians of Alexandria. There is a sign of a spiritual tremor of revival being made manifest in that strategic locale as prophesied from the days of Isaiah. A sign that in the natural we can observe as we see things that, 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 that people may have thought could never happen as we see things that people may have said were impossible as we see things that only the supernatural hand of God could cause to happen, happen. Yeah. Hmm, there are some supernatural things that are coming in this season. And things that may have been stuck in a state of discord or in a state of being unsettled for generations and families and for, senate, for, for, for centuries on the global scale, now creaking. You know, when a great thing, a ship moves and is listed, creaks. And now creaking as they, they, they move, by, by, by the mighty hand of God's deliverance and of his compassion as we watch mountains move so that the sovereign will of God can be made manifest in our present age. This will be a season, saints of God, hear me well. This will be a season where that which once was impossible 
will now be made possible. Where those that we may have completely counted out as lost will now find the light of the messianic truth of Jesus Christ. And where that which we have dreamed of <laughs> for what may have seemed like an eternity will now be made reality in the natural in the natural we will be able to watch movement of obstacles that may have splintered the body of true believers Yeshua's body we, 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 we will be able to watch Movement of, of obstacles that may have splintered the body of true believers that may have broken apart churches for centuries start to shift out of their position by the sovereign will of God as we watch on the global scale the Oriental Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church try to resolve their theological difference in a bid to truly become one in Christ. And as we watch the Coptic Orthodox and Greek Orthodox patriarchs of Alexandria also try to resolve their age-old differences to be able to unify and to strengthen the body of Christ. Oh, if my people, who which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. When you want to hear from God, you got to do what God says. But as we see this, this unifying of the universal body of Christ, uh, and as we intercede for the revival of our spiritual foundations to happen, saints of God, we, we have got to be armed with truth. And we've got to, 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 to be fervently empowered. By the Ruach HaKodesh, you got to have the Holy Spirit. See, teaching may take you to another level. Uh, fellowship may, may do your heart well. But it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. In this season, God is calling for some fire-breathing men and women of God. That will speak to impossible situations. And speak and declare things that be not as though they were. Oh, God is an awesome God. <clears throat> Even at the birth of Christ, as Joseph was cautioned to flee, to flee to Egypt, the influence of Greece's early colonization of, the, of, of so much of Rome had settled in even up to the noted Julius Caesar and his general Mark Anthony, who were known to have trained, I'm reading history, their legions in the Spartan manner, idolizing their, uh, their, their fortitude. Now, now, classical antiquity, that shows us the powerful link of the Greco-Roman world, is a topic really all by itself, unto itself. I mean, we could just speak on that alone. But, 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 but last week we started addressing the spirit because we are doing spiritual warfare. There are seven keys to the spirit of Alexander the Great that are so strategically entrenched in the Judeo-Christian and even in the Arabic dynamic entrenched to this day. Now under the sound of my voice, those of you that are intercessors, this is what you must focus your battle on. Sister Kira, get ready to read for me Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Hallelujah. 
we, 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 we focused on, on idolatry, which is basically hero worship, uh, humanism, we, 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 where people uh, are so caught up in personality cults that they'll call wrong right. <laughs> we, we focused on, on fascination, being transfixed and held spellbound by an irresistible power to, to another one of those points that I want to focus on today, which is governmental ideology. Uh, this is really what in the natural started the whole track of uh, Joseph and, and Mary and Jesus on the road to Egypt uh, as directed by the angelic messenger of God. Sister Kira, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east at its rising and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed and troubled and the whole of Jerusalem with him. Alexander, thank you, the great, spent his 13-year reign working to unite east and west through military force and cultural exchange conquering territories stretching from Greece to Egypt and through present-day Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan. Uh, but apart from military might, his incredible accomplishment was made possible by the Greek thought and philosophy that fascinated and still fascinates many in the world Today, hear me well, one of the foundational beliefs that held and still holds the Alexander the Great system and spirit in place is the belief in the superiority of the Greek over the barbarian which led them to reasoning that, 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 that the ideological institution of their system w w was a noble mission of the civilization uh, uh, of those of lesser thought and, and, and uh, even of lesser means. Now, 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 this ideological system translated and still to this day translates into today's vernacular as elitism. Elitism. I in political science, uh, elitism is best described uh, as elite theory, which the Encyclopedia Britannica states is a theoretical perspective according to which a community's affairs are best handled by a small subset of its members. And in, in, in modern societies, such an arrangement is, in fact, inevitable. Sister Donnett, get ready to read for me Proverbs chapter 22, verses 16 to 18. Proverbs 22, verses 16 to 18. Elitism, to, 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 to where the, the, the rich... They get richer and throw crumbs at the poor and the power of national, economic, and major decisions is, is left in the hands of the elite who, who, who first, the first thing they do is they, they, they fatten themselves and then they trickle down blessings if they feel so motivated to do, which in most cases, they don't. <laughs> in actuality, Greed, greed, the spirit of greed causes them to never trickle down blessings to poor people uh, like the, the grassroot folk <laughs> because they only further fatten themselves and even the little that the poor man has... 
will be taken away from him. Sister Donnett. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 16 to 18. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Bow, bow down thy ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing, if thou keep them within thee, they shall with, withal be fitted in thy lips. So, so regardless of, of who tries to peddle elitism, whether it's subtly or, or, or be a, by allowing the elite to cause you to pimp out your following and bamboozle the poor, it is wrong. It goes against the will and the word of God. Proverbs chapter 14 verses 31 to 32. He who oppresses the poor taunts and insults his maker. But he who is kind and merciful and gracious to the needy honors them. The wicked is overthrown through his wrongdoing, but the righteous has hope and confidence and a refuge with God, even in death. Oh, saints of God, Jesus had compassion. He had compassion for the poor, and he loved to be with them. I love the grassroot people. I preach in many a grassroot church. I don't care. You could call me a pot cake. <laughs> I love the poor because it's with the poor where you get to see the reality of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's with the poor where you can speak the word to those things that be not as though they are. With the same supernatural power of God that brings healing to our bodies, we can speak to spirits of poverty, we can speak to spirits of lack, and we can curse them, and we can change the destinies, we can change the purpose, we can change the lives of the people that are downtrodden. It is wrong to step on the back of poor people. It is wrong in the sight of God to take advantage of poor people and to throw crumbs at them and to bamboozle them. It's wrong. I don't care who you are. I don't care what title you have in the front of your name. It's wrong in the sight of God. Jesus had compassion for the poor and he loved to be with them. My God, this morning we thank God for his excellent kingdom and the fact that he came to truly destroy the evil works of darkness, to give hope to the hopeless and to uplift the fallen the distraught and the weak. My final scripture this morning. Second Corinthians. Chapter 8. Verses 8 to 10. Second Corinthians chapter 8. Verses 8 to 10. I am not saying this as a command to dictate to you, but to prove by pointing out the enthusiasm of others, the sincerity of your love as well. For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, 
that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich, abundantly blessed. I give you my opinion in this matter. This is to your advantage. Who were the first to begin a year ago not only to take action, to help the believers in Jerusalem, but also the first to desire to do it. You see, we are in an age where people, they don't want to give up anything. They do not want to give up anything and they want to take what the little man has. I will always be on the side of the little man. Because Jesus was always on the side of the little man. There is absolutely nothing you can offer me. There is no money, no prestige, no power that you can offer me to cause me to change from what thus saith the Lord. The Lord is angry with the elitist who persecute, who rob, and who bamboozle the little man. The God that we serve, he came to his own. And his own received him not. But to them, that's to us, to them, I don't care what country you come from. To them, I don't care what color you are. To them, I don't care what language you speak. To them that believed, he gave them power to become sons and daughters of the living God. Oh, I thank God that he came. I'm not ignorant. I'm the president of the Jewish Christian Network. I know he was born in the, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles, but the exact date of his birth is not as significant as the fact that he came. And when he came, he brought blessing, he brought release, he brought healing, he brought redemption, he fulfilled all prophecy, he is the king of kings, he is the Lord of lords. His name is Yeshua or Jesus, whatever you want to call him. Oh, what a wonderful child. In the matchless name of Yeshua, Hamasiah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah.